Tonight, Brazil is using mainstream mobile apps for some surprising purposes. Facebook has a new trick for competing with YouTube. And a major mobile payment service is changing its name. We'll tell you why. Stick around. Tech News Tonight is next. This is Twit. This is Tech News Tonight, episode 123 for Monday, July 7th, 2014. This episode of Tech News Tonight is brought to you by Personal Capital. With Personal Capital, you'll finally have all your financial life in one place and get a clear view of everything you own. Best of all, it's free. To sign up, go to personalcapital.com slash TN2. I'm Mike Elgin. Let's get right into our top four story. Forbes mobile writer Parmi Olson wrote a fascinating piece today on Brazil's use of two popular mobile apps to track the movement of World Cup fans through the city of Rio de Janeiro. She joins us now to talk about it. Welcome, Parmi. Hi. So what are these apps and how are they using them exactly? So Waze is a very popular driver navigation app. It's got more than 50 million users, uh, active users around the world, and 5 million users in Brazil. Um, and it uses crowdsourced data from all the people who use the app to help create its maps and also help to detect traffic. Um, recently, Waze has started sharing some of the updates that people put into the app uh, with local governments, um, two in particular, the government of Rio de Janeiro and the state of Florida. Um, the Rio de Janeiro partnership started in the summer of last year. Um, it's been going on since then. And state of Florida is much more recent, just in the last few months. And other um, municipalities, uh, states, and cities are in the pipeline. Um, I wrote this story because I thought it was very interesting that Waze as a free app was kind of flipping the use case for um, what it was, how it was using its data, not just for advertisers, but using the aggregated data for another third party, like a local government. Um, and interestingly, a very similar app called Move It which is also crowdsourced, but for pedestrians who are using trains and subways, is also sharing its data um, as a service with local governments, allowing them to also track um, where smartphones are moving to help detect traffic, foot traffic. And the kind of, for me, the overarching theme here is this is how um, some consumer apps are starting to help governments use our smartphones, not just, you know, uh, as individual smartphones, but see all of them as kind of this network of sensors that help give feedback on how people are moving and how cars are moving and just what's going on in the city in real time. And of course, Waze, uh, which is owned by Google, uh, but runs separately, is perfect for that sort of thing because it has a feature that enables you to uh, notify uh, ostensibly other other users, but apparently right. governments as well. There's an accident, there's a roadblock, there's a, you know, th th that kind of data can be very, very useful for a government that intends to go out there and solve some of the traffic problems and keep traffic flowing and so on. Now, Waze tracks drivers and Move It tracks people who walk or use public transportation. What about bicycle riders? Is there anything going on there right. in Rio? Yes, yeah, so there's also a, a bicycle uh, cycling app called Strava, um, which has several million users. Um, and that's for cyclists who want to compete against one another and they can kind of um, you know, share how fast they're going on a certain route um, and compare that against other drivers. And they have a service called Strava Metro, which they're actually selling um, to local governments, which allows them to also track where those cyclists are moving in real time. And what's kind of interesting about that is that this is, um, you know, for users of Strava who are using that as a free service, um, there it's automatically you opt into that. You have to opt out to not be part of that. Um, and the other difference with Waze and Move It is that Strava is selling um, that data um, 80 cents per user per year, um, whereas Move It and Waze are trading the data for more data from local governments so they can make their apps even smarter and more robust. Wow, that's incredible. Now, is this a model for all other cities? I mean, the, the, you have these two cities who are doing this. It sounds very beneficial. I don't really see the downside other than maybe a potential public backlash when people find out that uh, local or federal governments are using their data. But do you think we're going to see a global trend in the use of consumer apps like this for urban transportation planning or other examples? Yeah, I, th I think it's um, for people who are involved in urban planning, it's it's in some ways it's a godsend to finally have real-time data from real moving people. Um, I mean, it should be noted with Waze, 
they do passively track your GPS, your location, but they don't share that with governments. They don't do that now. Who knows what they'll do in the future? Right now it is just the updates, but the potential to track um, is certainly there. And uh, for what I've heard from Waze and from Move It and from Strava is that um, multiple cities and municipalities and local governments are in the pipeline um, to get access to the data that they're generating from their consumer users. Um, and the interesting, in talking to Waze, you know, the possibilities of where that could lead in the future um, if that monitoring becomes even more robust is incentivizing drivers um, to leave their house 30 minutes early so they could get gas credit from their local council. You know, those kinds of tie-ups they're thinking about. Um, obviously, they can't put that into play yet, but those are some of the things that they're actually considering in terms of where those partnerships could lead. Fantastic. What a world. Well, Parmi Olson, of course, is at Forbes.com. And where can people find you, Parmi, on social media? Uh, so I'm just on Twitter at Parmi, P-A-R-M-Y. Thank you so much for joining us on Tech News tonight. All right. Thank you. All right. Well, coming up, if you don't like bees, wait till you meet the robot version. Well, in just a sec, we're going to get to that. But first, we want to tell you about our sponsor today. I want to tell you about a free and secure tool called Personal Capital that solves two barriers to growing your wealth. The first barrier is that it's hard to keep track of stocks, 401ks, bank accounts, and all that. And they're all in different sites with different usernames and different passwords. The second barrier is that you pay someone to manage your money, and you're probably paying too much. Personal Capital brings all your accounts and assets on one single screen on your computer, phone, or tablet with real-time and intuitive graphs. It shows you how much you're overpaying in fees and how to reduce those fees. You also get tailored advice on optimizing your investment. So why wait? Signing up takes just a minute, and it'll pay big dividends. Personal Capital gives you total clarity and transparency to make better investment decisions right away. To set up your free account, go to personalcapital.com TN2. Personal Capital is free and the smart way to grow your money. But you must go to personalcapital.com TN2. That's personalcapital.com TN2. And now let's jump straight into the tech feed. Facebook started testing over the weekend a new interface for mobile videos. If you watch a friend's video on Facebook using the mobile Facebook app, you might now be offered a carousel of additional suggested videos. The feature test was discovered by a VentureBeat writer who also confirmed it with the company. The article speculated that the new interface could be used to offer video ads in the future. Facebook announced the acquisition last week of LiveRail, a company that specializes in making relevant video ad suggestions. Another possible use for the interface is to get people to spend more time on Facebook watching videos, enabling Facebook to compete with YouTube and eventually gain a foothold on the new generation of internet-centric set-top boxes. A company called Isis is one of the leading mobile payment players. The company is a joint venture between the major U.S. mobile carriers, including AT&T, T-Mobile, and Verizon, and exists to promote NFC-based payments using smartphones. Unfortunately, Isis is also the name of the Sunni militant group currently taking over Iraq. ISIS stands for Islamic State of Iraq and Al-Sham, Al-Sham being a reference to Syria. So ISIS, the mobile payment company, announced today that it's going to change its name in the months ahead, and I think that's probably a pretty good idea. We've reported in the past that NASA might take Google's Project Tango phones into space. Today we learned that it's going to happen as early as this week. The phones are scheduled to be part of a cargo launch on Friday. Project Tango phones use special software and hardware to rapidly map 3D spaces in real time. They'll be used by NASA as the robot eyes for the agency's Spheres robots, which are soccer ball-sized robots that navigate in zero Gs using tiny blasts of CO2. The Project Tango-enhanced Spheres robots will be ejected into space to gather data on the space station's exterior, a job that used to require a risky EVA mission by human astronauts. And finally, tiny flying robot insects are not only terrifying, they're also impractical. Last year, Harvard researchers created what they called robo-bees, bee-sized robots that could hover in midair. The trouble is that they had to be tethered because they couldn't carry all the weight required for their motors, sensors, and batteries. But scientists are still making progress. Those same researchers told Business Insider today that within 10 years, robot bees will not only be able to fly long distances untethered, They'll even be able to pollinate fields of crops, which might be necessary if bees keep dying off from pesticides and other causes. Personally, I think it's a terrible idea, unless, of course, they could be engineered to make honey, too. Well, that's it for this edition of Tech News Tonight. 
Subscribe to this show at twit.tv slash TN2 and write us at TN2 at twit.tv. Don't miss our morning news program, Tech News Today, tomorrow and every weekday at 10 a.m. Pacific, 1 p.m. Eastern. I'm Mike Elgin. Thanks for watching. Bandwidth for Tech News Tonight is brought to you by Cashfly.com.